Hey, welcome to week four of the six week pursuit. Today's, uh, well, what we're titling today's discussion is the results of discipline. And you can tell how professional I am by the fact I have to glance at my notes to remember the title. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, the results of discipline. Um, we're talking about Paul today. Last uh, Sunday, we talked about Elijah and Elisha. They lived lives of power. Amazing story of how God um, works in other people and talked about how um, just God's authority um, was so active in their lives. And God's authority and power was active in Paul's life too, but we're going to focus on a different aspect of God's authority today. And that is that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And Paul, Paul is a perfect demonstration of God's strength working um, in our weakness. When we're weak, he's made strong. So we're going to go ahead, I want to go ahead and start off with our first point for you to write down on your notes. And that is, Paul's strength began with his weakness. Paul's strength began with his weakness. So to really get a picture of Paul's, um, the lesson we can learn from Paul, we need to look at his story. Paul was originally a young man named Saul. And Saul was very passionate for God. But it, it was the kind of passion that was misguided, um, led him to oversee the murder of Christians and have Christians thrown in prison. So, um, yeah, misguided. Misguided is a, is a nice way of putting it. Paul was very passionate for God and the law, and he saw Christians as a threat to God's law. He saw them as uh, blasphemers and he just misunderstood. He was misguided. And I mean, it's hard to argue that he wasn't passionate. He definitely was, but um, he needed um, some direction with that passion. That's where Jesus steps in. Paul's on the road to go and persecute some Christians in a place called Damascus. And on the way there, a beam of light falls down from the sky and is so brilliant, so blinding, he, he goes flying off his donkey, smashes into the dirt. Um, and all of a sudden, God's voice fills the air about him and uh, says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, now Saul being a, a devout man, the equivalent of a guy that grew up in church back in that day. Um, he knows this is God speaking, but he's confused. So he says, Lord, whom am I persecuting? Who are you? Who are you, Lord? And then it's the, the answer just smacks him in the face like a ton of bricks. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Man, that must have hit hard in that moment. And right after that, Jesus, I mean, Jesus tells Paul, go to Damascus, and you're going to wait there, and, and you're just going to wait. A guy named Ananias, a man of God, he's going to show up, and uh, he's, he's going to minister to you, and then he's going to tell you what you got to do, but you got to wait there. Uh, Saul gets up, he's blind, can't see a thing. Saul's walk with Jesus immediately begins with discipline. And, and what's interesting is he, go, he goes, he's obedient, he listens. And when he gets there, he fasts, meaning he devotes himself to prayer. He devotes himself to seeking God and trying to figure out what's going on, trying to figure out what, what has he misunderstood about God. And then in the midst of that, God speaks to a man named Ananias, a man who's going to go and heal Paul of his blindness and send him on his God-given mission. And this is what we read about what God says to Ananias in Acts chapter 9, starting with verse, um, uh, sorry, uh, verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for Paul, Saul at this time, excuse me, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him, I will show Saul how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias goes, 
He heals Paul, and Paul begins his walk with Jesus. And his walk with Jesus is marked by suffering. He suffers. Just to iterate on that point of what God calls Paul to, our second blank today, second point to fill in is Jesus told Ananias that Paul was chosen by God. He was chosen. Jesus told Ananias that Paul was chosen and that he would suffer much for the sake of his name. Paul was chosen and he would suffer much for the sake of Jesus' name. Paul's walk of faith, number three, your third blank, his walk of faith was marked with discipline and suffering. He was chosen. He was called. But he was going to suffer. And the rest of his walk with God was marked with discipline and suffering. You see, there are two kinds of suffering. Two kinds of suffering when we follow Jesus. You see, Jesus told us, he, he warned us, the world hates him. The world hates God. Back in the beginning, when Adam and Eve rejected God and said, we want to do what we want to do, we now have a natural hatred within us. Oh, sorry, hit my microphone. That must have been uh, jarring. <laughs> um, we have a natural hatred and loathing towards God. Some of us think, no, 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 I grew up in the church. I, I've never, I've never not known God. I've always been faithful. No, the fact is, God saved you by his grace at an early age and you are very fortunate and I'm very fortunate because I share, that's my story too. But we need to recognize church that whether we grew up knowing Jesus our whole lives or we're new to this walk, God saved you and you didn't do anything to earn that salvation. No, we didn't earn it. Our natural tendency, all of us, every single one of us, our natural human fleshly nature is to hate and reject God. And that's why we still to this day, even after we've been following Jesus for years, we don't like being told what to do. We don't like being told what to give up. And we hate the idea of suffering. But Jesus said, if we follow him, we will suffer because the world hates him. Now here's the, now here's the thing. As soon as we commit our lives to Jesus, as soon as we decide to follow him, we're now moved into sharing his life, which has so many wonderful blessings. God moves in our lives. He gives us his kindness, his goodness, his love, and he transforms us. He renews us. He builds us up. But also, since we're now associated with him, the rest of the world that struggles with that same nature you and I struggle with will now hate you. You're going to run into people that hate you, church. Hate you. You already see it in the news. If you follow Jesus, you're going to be hated by someone. Not because of anything you've done, but because of who he is and what he's done. And because of what <laughs> our nature. So that's the first suffering. Paul suffered. He followed Jesus, so people hated him. They persecuted him. They tried to kill him. He suffered for following Jesus. But the thing is, when you follow Jesus, there's a second kind of suffering. There's another one, and that's that if you follow Jesus, he's going to discipline you. Paul said, in my weakness, he is strong. In my weakness, he is strong. And in the book of Hebrews, we read about how if we are faithful to God, if we're in his love, if we're in relationship with God, if he's going to discipline us. And not because he hates you, not because he wants to destroy you. See, God's discipline is not like the world's discipline. God's discipline is always justified, is always fair, and it's always for your benefit. God is not like our mothers and fathers who lost their tempers, flew off the handle, said things they shouldn't have said, did things they shouldn't have done, were abusive, were hard. Not like that, no. God's discipline is always, always, every single time for your benefit. It's always. It's like, think of it as like, because when we, when we think of the word discipline, we usually think of it like with a negative connotation, a negative context. A ne like we hear the word discipline, it's like, oh, I don't, I don't like the sound of that. I don't want to be disciplined. But you do. Self-discipline, that's a good context, right? Think of self-discipline. Whether we're good at self-discipline or not, we all know it's a good thing. It's a good thing to exercise, a good thing to avoid certain foods. It's a good thing to um, 
watch after our health. It's, it, there are good disciplines in life. It's good to read our Bible. It's good to pray. It's good to be giving. It's good to be, there, there are disciplines that are good. Self-discipline is a good thing. And God's discipline is even better than your self-discipline. Because guess what? Our self-discipline is limited because we are broken. We're sinful. We're wretched human beings broken by our sin. So our self-discipline can only carry us so far. But God's discipline can take us places we never thought capable of going. As a guy who um, is a natural recluse and rather shy, God has disciplined me a lot over the years. And his discipline has been making me uncomfortable and um, putting me in situations I never wanted to be in, talking with people I never thought I could even speak to. And he's taught me through that. He's grown me. He's stretched me. Now, was it fun? No. <laughs> Discipline's never fun. If you're having fun, you're not being disciplined. <laughs> Discipline isn't fun. It's hard. It's rigorous. And sometimes it's even painful. And sometimes you even suffer. Paul suffered in his discipline, but through that discipline, he became strong. So I want to note that as our point number four. There are two kinds of disciplines, two kinds of suffering. The first is the world will harm you to kill you. The world you live in will harm you to kill you. Our point number four is the world will harm you to kill you. God will discipline you to give you life. The world you live in is naturally destructive. The world we live in is destructive. We see it, it's obvious. Just watch the news, hear about, listen to someone talk about the news. Our world's destructive. You can try to deny it all you want. Our world is naturally destructive. That's our world. But God disciplines to give life. His discipline's for giving you life. His discipline is so that you will have life. His discipline is so that we will grow into God, who God has called us to be. His discipline is so that we can learn, so that we can flourish. Think of it as pruning a tree. Why do you prune a tree? It's because trees just kind of grow like crazy. They don't care. They don't have thought to how they grow. They just grow. But the problem is all that growth they throw on, it's, it's harmful. It, that growth stunts the cherries, stunts the apples, stunts the pears, it stunts the fruit of the tree. It stunts the tree from growing how it's supposed to grow because it's just kind of growing. However, if you prune it, you can direct that growth to the fruit, to the, to the cherry, to the apple, to the pear, to the pe whatever it is. That's what God does when he disciplines us. It's like pruning. The, word, the Bible uses that example. God wants to prune you. He wants to discipline you, just like he disciplined Paul so that he would grow. Paul talks about a thorn in his flesh. He never, we don't know what that means. So many people have debated on what this thorn in his flesh was. We don't know. It could have been a physical ailment. Could have been a, a struggle with sin. We don't know. The fact is, Paul says, I've asked God to take this thing away from me, but God has constantly told me, in your weakness, I am strong. See, church, we need to become weak. We need to become pitiful. Realize just how weak we are. And when we submit to God's discipline, when we submit to Him, we become weak so that He can be strong. Church, there's no revival in you being studious enough, disciplined enough, good enough. There's only revival in God's strength. There's only a moving of the Holy Spirit. There's only power. There's only authority when God's strength is active and when we step back and let him do what he wants to do and part of that church, and it's not easy, it's painful, but part of letting God do what he wants, letting God have his way is submitting to his discipline. Submitting, saying, God, I trust you. I trust you. I know you care for me. I know you love me. And I know you have my best interests in mind, so I submit to your discipline. Do what you want, because I want to grow. I want, I want to grow into who you've called me to be. And sometimes it'll be miserable. Sometimes it'll be hard. Sometimes it'll be difficult, but, but. Discipline, final point. Discipline is painful, but later produces peaceful, good living. 
you want to look like Jesus, if you want to see the power of God move, we need to submit, admit we're weak, let him discipline us so that he can be made strong. And let me just encourage you, church, his discipline is never to destroy you. It's never to belittle you. It's never to make you small. It's never to make you cry and be pathetic. I mean, sometimes his discipline might have us crying and saying, God, forgive me. Sometimes that is the result. And sometimes his discipline is very harsh and very strict. But it's always, it's always so that you will flourish. He always knows what discipline's best for you. You can trust him. He's faithful. He's good. And he has your best interests in mind because he loves you. He gave his life for you. He died and rose again so that we could have life abundant. And that abundant life is rooted in trusting him. You can trust him. You can trust his discipline. And he only wants to grow you. So can I pray for you, church? Jesus, we want to see your power. We want to see your authority. We want to see you move in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our communities around us, and in our church, God. We want to see you move, but we know that will never happen unless we, like Paul, submit to discipline. And it's not fun. So I pray, Jesus, to everyone who submits that you would give them grace and peace and that you would increase their trust in you because you're good. You're not out to destroy them. You're not out to just get them and make them miserable. Your discipline is only ever so that we would grow and flourish into who you've called us to be. Have your way in my friends and family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I pray that you're blessed today, church, especially as you go through the study. I hope you do. Um, Go through this study, and as you answer the questions, I just pray that God blesses you and grows you and encourages you. So all I can say is be blessed, church family. God is for you.